Uh, December the 7th, 1922, Joel Benjamin Paris III uh, enlisted. In fact, uh, it was unusual. I was one of the very few that uh, never did get a draft number because I was never signed up for the draft. I had just graduated from uh, uh, high school and I hadn't filed for the draft yet and hadn't received a number. And the war started and I volunteered and went off to war. Well, I finally retired as a major general. I came back to Georgia and became the adjutant general when I retired from the service uh, as a full colonel. Came back to Georgia and was promoted to uh, major general as adjutant general. Well, when the Japanese attacked uh, the United States, uh, it was a sneak attack and I thought I'd uh, help uh, penalize them for what they did. And I thought the best way to do it was to fly a fighter. It had carried guns. Well, I, I wanted to join the Air Force. Uh, all, ever since I was a little kid, I'd wanted to fly. The, and uh, when uh, the war started, I went down to sign up uh, to fly. And they said you had to have two years of college minimum. And so I didn't join. And about oh, two weeks later, they called me on the phone and said they had, uh, it was now if you took a test uh, uh, equivalent to two years of college, that if you could pass it, they'd let you fly. Uh, you could become a pilot. And so I went down and took the uh, test downtown. Uh, in fact, it was at the old post office building. And uh, took the test and passed it. It was uh, about a five-hour test, and uh, I didn't think it was particularly hard. But after I passed that, then the next day they gave me a six-hour test uh, aviation exam. And it was much harder than the college exam was. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I was lucky, fortunate that uh, I passed it and they accepted me uh, to flying school. And they went off to fly, uh, was first sent to uh, uh, Gunner Field in uh, uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, they had so many people that were volunteering to join that they had more pilots, more people than they had room to handle them at the time. So they put us in uh, Gunner Field in what they call cold storage. And we stayed there about three weeks, uh, killing time until they could have room enough for us over at, I uh, 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 can't even think of the name of the base now, but uh, Montgomery. And uh, we went to that. Uh, then joined the cadets. Uh, they took us in as a cadet, and, and uh, training started then. But that was in uh, about March of, I guess right at the end of March of 42. Uh, 10 weeks, 12 weeks of uh, pre-flight training at uh, Maxwell Field is where it was. And when you went through that, uh, they then sent you to primary training which was to teach you to fly. Uh, and they sent me to Avon Park, Florida. And uh, they gave you about 60 hours of PT-17 flying for uh, uh, primary. And when you graduated from that, they sent you to basic, where I went to basic at, at uh, Gunner Field uh, uh, up in South Carolina. And uh, we had uh, about 10 weeks of training there in basic, and then they sent to, went to advance at Spencefield, Motor, Georgia. And that's where I graduated, and they made me a second lieutenant. So, and all that took place, uh, 
I graduated from fly, for flying school in uh, February of 43, when they put us in Gunner Field on cold storage. Uh, they were ill-prepared. They had no base uh, that would handle uh, a bunch of troops coming in. And they were just bringing these thousands of people that they were going to train as pilots in, and they didn't have room enough for them over at Maxwell Field yet, so they put them in cold storage over at, at Gunner. A gunner couldn't handle it either, so they dig long slit trenches, and I mean, you know, 50 yards long. And slit trenches, uh, because we had no no sewage, no uh, nothing. And instead of having a little little outhouses, they built 50 yard long outhouses, and with all little holes that go with them, and they, instead of putting uh, wood around it or and all closing it in, they just had canvas around it. Um, someone came in and and claimed, the do surgeons, I guess, claimed that they, they were contaminated, and uh, they wanted to blow torch these things to kill all the bugs and things that were crawling around on them. And so they asked for volunteers and nobody wanted to hold up the hand and they said, anybody know how to run a blowtorch? And country boy, I knew how to run a blowtorch and I was so young and stupid I said, yeah, I do. And so I volunteered uh, in their language anyway. And so they showed me the, uh, the blowtorch and showed me how to ask me to crank it, you know, and make it work, which I did. And uh, they said, okay, you know how to use it? And I go out there and use it on all those wood seats uh, to kind of burn all the bugs and all. So that was my job. That was my first job in the Air Force. <laughs> I, I don't know what the official MOS number was for that was. They never did issue me one. Uh, my mother uh, left her in Atlanta, and uh, she later moved off to Florida while I was gone. But uh, uh, I had a bunch of kin folks other than, uh, than my mother. Did you have a girlfriend at all? Uh, yeah, kind of. Didn't everybody at about, I was about 19 then. They sent me to the Pacific. Uh, in fact, I went to Hawaii and stayed in Hawaii f until December, uh, Christmas Eve night in 43. I shipped out of Hawaii going to the Southwest Pacific. I had asked to be transferred uh, because it, uh, didn't look like we were going to fight a war in Hawaii, and it looked like it was all over as far as they were concerned there. And the only part of the Pacific that was at war at that time was uh, down the Southwest Pacific, Guadalcanal, Solomon Islands, New Guinea, all through there. And I joined uh, the Fortnite Fighter Group there, and uh, about a year. I guess a year and a half later is when they invaded the Philippines and I had a chance to, I was in the hospital. We had got prepared, we were changing over to P-38s and we were flying 38s, uh, getting ready to invade the Philippines. We knew we were going to, none of the pilots knew when or where and uh, they wouldn't tell us of course and we didn't want to know because if you were captured, the Japanese would know a lot more than they should. Um, I got uh, yellow jaundice, uh, malaria, uh, and dengue fever all kind of combined and ended up in a tent hospital on, in Biak Island, on Biak Island. At that time, uh, they were holding me there to ship me back to the States on a hospital ship. 
and uh, they were holding the hospital ships because they were preparing for the invasion of uh, the Philippines. They put me in the hospital and was going to ship me back to the States, and I was down to about 125 pounds weight and because I couldn't eat anything. It death make you deathly sick to eat anything. So I figured the war was passing me by. They made the invasion of the Philippines, uh, I think, October the 9th. And uh, my outfit was, uh, squadron was up there, and so I picked up my clothes out of the hospital there, out of this tent, and had my gun, my boots, and my hat, and, and a khaki uniform, and walked out of the hospital, walked out of the tent, down the road, hitched a ride to the airstrip, walked down the line where C-47s were being pre-flighted, and uh, found one headed for the Philippines, and bummed a ride with them. And that's the way I got back to the Philippines. When I arrived at the Philippines, I was standing between the pilot and the co-pilot of this C-47, and they had a load of uh, what we call PSP, pure steel planking, and they were to build them an airstrip. And uh, I was standing between them, and the Japs were attacking uh, the harbor there at, at Lady. Uh, when we got there and Japanese airplanes were flying all around and anti-aircraft was firing, these fellas never had seen any anti-aircraft before and certainly never had seen a Japanese fighter. And they said, look at that airplane. And they asked, were asking me what the hell it was. I said, that's a damn Jap, get in a cloud. Uh, C-47 didn't carry many guns. <laughs> and uh, so they flew into a cloud there and circled in the cloud till for about 15 minutes and came out and the raid was over. So we went over and landed uh, at the Lady Airstrip and they uh, blinked him a red light. He wasn't supposed to land there. And I told him, go ahead and land. I'd get you out of trouble there. And of course, I thought I knew everything about what was going on. Anyway, they landed. I climbed out the back door, slammed the door, and told them to leave. <laughs> they took, turned around and took off again. Went down the coast about 20 or 30 miles to a strip that they were letting the transports land on. And they didn't want them to land on the, on the strip there at uh, Tack Loban because uh, they were saving it for the fighters to come back and refuel. And they didn't want it jammed up with a wrecked airplane on it. Uh, Anyway, I walked across the strip to where I saw our airplane parked. Saw the flight surgeon, and uh, he wanted to know what I was doing out of the hospital. And I said, oh, they turned me loose. He says, ah, they never let you out of the hospital. And I said, oh, yeah, they did. He said, we'll see. Anyway, uh, this was, uh, I guess, uh, about the early part of November. They'd been in, we'd made the landing in the Philippines about three weeks before. Uh, anyway, I started flying and flew missions and had shot down about five or six airplanes and the, uh, five I think to be exact, when a message came in from the 5th Fighter Command saying that I was AWOL out of the hospital and if they, if Anybody knew where I was, put me under arrest. And so they sent him a message back that said he'd shot down five airplanes since he'd been here. Well, I was getting over it when I went AWOL out of the hospital. I still couldn't eat anything. Of all the things that I could eat, the only thing I liked and could eat was canned spinach. And I've hated it ever since. <laughs> I had just joined this 7th Fighter Squadron uh, and we were flying P-40s in New Guinea. We were escorting B-24s into WeWAC where we were bombing. Uh, we saw, I saw a flight. We were a flight of four uh, P-40s and uh, I saw a uh, Jap down there flying along by himself below us and uh, pointed him out to the uh, a flight leader, who was a 
captain at that time, and he peeled off, and we drove up behind, and there were uh, five Japanese. It was a formation of flight, and uh, this one was lagging way behind. Anyway, they jumped on this uh, flight of uh, five uh, Japanese. This one did a 180-degree turn and started a loop, and I pulled up out of the formation and caught him at the top of the loop and shot him down. With a P-40, if you had any lead at all, uh, which you had to shoot way in front of an airplane, uh, your nose stuck out so far in front of you, you couldn't see what you were hitting uh, when you were pulling more than uh, three or four Gs. And uh, so I fired about a two-second burst and then relaxed the stick to see where it, what that damage I'd done, and he came out burning. Uh, in fact, he was just bailing out when he came out. And the airplane flipped over on its back and spun in and hit in the air, on the airstrip uh, inverted. We were assigned a, an Australian fighter a division, and uh, we were assigned to them for close cover. And we would go in and strafe and bomb and all uh, this Aussie, to assist this Aussie division. And it happened to be the 7th Division. We were the 7th Fighter Squadron. So it, it matched up very well. And uh, for a few months, that was uh, our main job was to uh, assist this division. And then we started escorting B-24s and B-25s into uh, WEWAC on the bombing missions. Uh, so it kept you pretty busy. Uh, when I was shot up and ended up shooting down a couple of airplanes and got the Silver Star and was for protecting a, a PBY, which we call a Dumbo uh, Air Rescue. And at this point, he was assigned to take uh, some ha uh, safe hand courier messages and maps into this landing that we had made, uh, that the uh, Army had made on uh, Mendora Island. And that's the picture of, on the wall back here of the airplane I was shooting down, and that was one of them. Um, we got jumped by 10 or 12 Japanese fighters. There were three of us escorting this uh, PBY. And uh, it got a little crowded there for a while uh, because they caught us at a medium altitude. We were about 12,000 feet, and they were coming down from about 25,000. And he, uh, uh, first thing he did was put a 20 millimeter shell through my canopy just above my head. Uh, put about four or five rounds of 51 caliber over my shoulder into the instrument panel, and it got a little crowded in there for a while. The, uh, he shot my right earphone off. Uh, so. But anyway, uh, he was sorry I shot him down. <laughs> he, he made a mistake. He overran me and passed me, and I shot him down going away. It was small, small stuff like uh, it was shrapnel the size of birdshot, really. And I was combing it out of my hair, yes, for about, oh, two or three weeks. Every time I'd comb my hair, I'd get little pieces of shrapnel would fall out. But I got some in my arm, in my legs, but nothing that was really uh, crippling. On the side of it was uh, Georgia Bell. My mother's name was Belle, uh, and she was from Georgia, so I thought that was rather appropriate. Uh, the, uh, I had one engine name for my sister, Marjorie, and the other name for my uh, ex-wife, Martha, and that was the one that always failed all the time, quit running. But anyway, the... Uh, uh, and we kept it decorated up pretty well. The, um, I think I went through about two or three Georgia Bells 
uh, me and some of my friends ended up getting them destroyed. But when I left, there was one still working. Well, I stayed around, shot down a couple of, of fighters that were still trying to shoot the PBY down. And I wouldn't leave him. And uh, one of my wingmen had separated from us, and he was up there about 25,000 feet uh, watching the fight. Uh, he and I had quite a heart-to-heart -heart talk when we got back uh, because in the middle of this fight, this wingman and myself were, were being shot at from all different directions for about, I guess, eight or ten minutes. We were, it was uh, kind of exciting there for a while. And we picked up a lot of bullet holes. He was up there at about 25,000 feet circling and all by himself up there. And uh, later on, I, well, a fighter, one of their fighters saw him up there and climbed up there and jumped between his booms there and chased him around the sky there. And he came barreling down in front of me calling uh, for the, to me to shoot this Jap off of his tail. And he flew right in front of me, so I shot this Jap down when he went by me. Uh, but anyway, we got, we stayed there, and uh, they all went home after we'd shot about three or four of them down. Uh, and we got relieved. Uh, a relief flight was due in just about the end of the fight, so they came in. We went back home. And so after I landed, uh, we got out of the airplane. The, uh, I had a little hard to hard talk with this wingman, and I asked him what the hell he was doing uh, flying around up at. He says, it was the most exciting thing I ever saw. He says, it was just like a movie. He says, and I just couldn't take my eyes off of it. He says, you know, they were attacking you from all sides. And every time they'd shoot at you, pieces would fly off of your airplane. And it was really exciting. I said, if you'd have been down there on the receiving end, it'd have been more exciting. But uh, anyway. That, I never will forget that was he thought that was the most exciting thing he ever saw was this fight going on down there and that he wasn't a part of. He was, it was like a movie. <laughs> Two airplanes I know of and a third one probably. The, uh, the, what was so amusing was that he was sent home right after that, fortunately for him. And uh, I saw him, I guess... Uh, about 15 years later, he was a 101 pilot up at uh, Shaw Field in Sumter, South Carolina. And I was a full colonel then, and uh, I flew in there. I was uh, one of the inspectors for the operational readiness test that we gave him. And uh, I took this team in there, and he was there. So I, I got to meet him again. He, he was a, at the time that he got in trouble, he was a uh, uh, captain. I mean, at the time he was, got in that fight with us. He had been promoted to a major, and I was a full colonel then. And uh, at that time we were in that fight, I was a captain also. But uh, he missed getting promoted somewhere or another. I, <laughs> some of the write-ups uh, probably didn't help him. Well, I ran out of ammo a couple of times, but, uh, and we were still, <clears throat> this was at the end of the fight. I always had ammo. I remember one airplane I shot down uh, was a twin engine fighter, and all I had left was one fifty caliber firing. Uh, I'd lost my gun sight. Uh, I'd run out of ammunition. And here was a twin engine fighter that was sitting there about 20 or 30 feet off the water running uh, near Cebu uh, City, headed for their airstrip, and I didn't want him to get there. And uh, he had been attacking a, a destroyer, one of our destroyers, and this was up the Philippines. Uh, I pulled up behind him. And the intelligence, they had a rear gunner in this twin engine fighter and a pilot in the front and a rear gunner in the back. And the intelligence people had told us that 
don't worry about the rear gun, just stay down below his level and he can't shoot you, uh, he can't depress the guns. Well, they'd been misinformed, because uh, I pulled up behind this twin engine uh, fighter and knowing I didn't have a gun sight, only had one gun firing, I wanted to be close enough that I was going to be sure and get him. And so I pulled up under the no under his tail, and when I slid out from under the tail to line up with his left engine uh, to shoot it out, or catch it on fire, uh, when I slid out, I looked up, and this rear gunner had a pair of 51 caliber uh, pointed right at me, just, and I was maybe 10 feet, 15 feet from the end of the barrel. And when he fired, I was so close I could feel a concussion of the gun firing. And I ran back under his tail there and looked all around and I couldn't see any holes and I couldn't figure out, hell, he could have thrown a rock and hit me. And uh, uh, I couldn't figure out how he could fire both guns at me and miss me. And so I figured, boy, he's really a terrible shot. And so anyway, I slid out my and, and uh, crossed controls and pointed the nose at him and fired about five rounds and killed him. And he drooped over the back end of the hanging by his seatbelt. And so I just straightened it out and aimed for the left engine and caught it on fire. Fired maybe 15 rounds, uh, hit his oil lines, hydraulic lines, just poured hydraulic fluid and oil back on me. And it caught, it caught fire and I pulled off and he dove it into the water. He was only about 20 or 30 feet off the water to start with. So he, when I was shooting at him, I was thinking about getting out from under him because if I hit him and uh, shot his wing off or whatever, he's going to hit the water and I'm going to hit him. So I slid out. Just as I slid out, he hit the water and exploded. Oh, no, I'd been in combat in the P-40s, but uh, not in the 38s. Uh, I never had fired at anger, in anger with the 38s. But uh, I was checked out in it, and they I took over and started flying. Uh, I was a, a flight commander then. Uh, so I moved right on up and I'd shot down, I would, had shot down more airplanes than anybody else in the squadron at that time. The uh, couple that were, had shot down as many as me had just been sent back to the States. So uh, I was a leading ace in the squadron at that time, so we, I, I pretty well did what I wanted to. Um, led all the squadron flights and all. Uh, and got in a bunch of fights. Uh, I shot down an airplane on Christmas Day, shot one down on my birthday. If you shoot down five confirmed kills, uh, that's considered an ace. Uh, anybody who flies combat very long uh, and does, gets in and mixes it up, shoots a lot of airplanes down to get no credit for. And uh, it's common because you're in the middle of a fight and you're shooting and maybe you kill a pilot. Or maybe he dove into the ground later or hit a mountain or whatever. You got him, but you didn't see what happened to him and you had no one to confirm it. Uh, your gun camera film didn't show anything except that you were getting hits on him, but he wasn't burning and he looked like he was under control. And you would have other people shooting at you or coming in on you and all. So you were busy protecting yourself. So you didn't, the idea wasn't to confirm a kill, your own kill, because it didn't do you any good anyway, uh, if you were gonna get yourself killed trying to confirm a kill. The camera had to confirm it, that it was burning or crashed or exploded or whatever to be sure that you had got him. Uh, 
are either confirmed by one of the other pilots in the squadron uh, that they saw you shoot him down. And uh, that was the only way you could get a confirmed kill. And so I know that I had shot down probably, oh, I got credit, I think, for seven probables that everybody was certain that I had gotten. But there were probably others. Um, I, I got uh, nine confirmed, uh, but I would say probably I shot down another uh, twice that many. Uh, I mean, shot down probably another 10 or 12 airplanes that you never got credit for. And you weren't there to get credit. Uh, that wasn't the idea. You were there to eliminate Japanese. Uh, and if you were so busy trying to get a confirmed kill by flying back and get, taking a picture of it or something, you may not survive the place anyway. So uh, it didn't do you a hell of a lot of good. And it didn't make a lot of difference. Uh, but some people were aggressive and would jump right into the middle of a fight. Some were a little shy and would stay around the fringes and uh, some would come home with the tape still over the end of the guns and never fired the guns. Uh, so they were, they'd go along for company and that was about all. Uh, but you used, you know, you were an old head in the squadron if you'd been there six months. I mean, you were one of the old ones. And it was amazing. You could, uh, the new pilots would come in two or three at a time. Uh, and everybody got a chance to talk to them over in the mess hall or over supper or whatever. And it was amazing how you could, and everybody would agree who was going to be able to survive and who wouldn't. There was just something about them that made them a survivor flying with them maybe one time and seeing how they reacted and what they did and what they saw and how alert they were. And I mean, as I say, it's hard to put your finger on, but you could pick the survivors. And it was, it was scary, really, how you could tell that a fellow wasn't going to make it. I mean, he wasn't going to survive very long. In fact, you wanted to help them. Uh, the more you help them, the more you could teach them, the more hangar talk you could talk around them and tell them tales, you know, tell them what to do and not do, uh, things to watch out for. Uh, they were there to help you. You weren't there to show your superiority. Uh, that wasn't the idea at all. I always took the new men, uh, after I'd been in the outfit a while, take the new men, put them on your wing, take them out on a escort mission and peel off from the bombers after they'd hit the target and started home, peel off and go down and strafe one of the airfields and uh, to see how they reacted, to see how they were, how close they'd stick to you. They're supposed to stay right with you. Uh, you didn't want to fly down the airstrip all the way and come up on the other end after shooting things up and look around and he wasn't with you. He'd flown over it. <laughs> uh, but they, you know, you could, you could tell, you know, if they, how eager they were, how aggressive they were, and if you really wanted to, to test them, when you got to the end of the strip, you pulled up, turned around, and went back up it again. Uh, now, 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 after alerting them that you were headed down the airstrip, shooting up some of their equipment or people uh, and then stir them all up. And then when you came back down it again, they were really wired for sound. They were ready. It wasn't a longevity thing uh, because you were there too. And you were no more armored than they were. Uh, but you know, you're young, you're 20, one or two years old. Uh, you think you're bulletproof. You don't think anybody can kill you. 
if they kill you, it was an accident. I mean, they, they were shooting at somebody else and happened to hit you. Uh, but they was, it, was, it was a feeling that you had and an attitude that you had that, that you weren't afraid of them. Uh, we had people, the Japanese uh, in the war would, <clears throat> we would initiate a head-on pass with them because we had more guns and we were armored and all that. We had bulletproof glass right in front of your face. Uh, they didn't have all that, and we would initiate a head-on pass to them, and uh, they didn't like that at all. Uh, later on, and a little while in the war, they would uh, initiate a head-on pass, and you could watch out for those because they were going to run into you. You'd fire as long as you could, and at the last instant, break under them or over them, uh, but you only did it at the very last instant, which didn't give them a chance to collide with you. Uh, and they were they were scary people. I mean, they were they were after you to kill you. They were the ones that would couldn't shoot you down, but they could run into you. Just depended upon the situation. If you were kind of diving down at them, you might want to pull up over them. If uh, you were climbing at them, you might want to dodge under them. But it's whichever one was the quickest, easiest way to exceed. Do anything but roll it up and try to turn. You just just pitch it down or pitch it up, just the last second. And uh, do your best to kill him on the way. Uh, if he initiated a head-on pass, you did your damnedest to kill him before he could get close to you. And often you did uh, explode him or kill him head on because, as I said, they, were, they weren't armored. They, they had high-pressure oxygen tanks, and if you put a bullet in that, it'd go off like a bomb. So uh, in the Pacific, you didn't, uh, you didn't go home by missions. Uh, I think I had 187 missions. Uh, we had guys in the outfit that had flown 230. They just stayed there till they got shot down or whatever, got killed. But of, later on, uh, when the European war began to, to quieten down, they started sending replacements in. And we would go home with maybe uh, 100 missions or whatever they felt like was about your time to go. Oh, I just, as I say, a lot of it was luck, uh, being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I saw a lot of friends shot down, a lot of them killed in uh, uh, mechanical problems. Uh, Remember, we didn't have much mechanics. Uh, they expanded the Air Force so rapidly that a lot of the people working on airplanes, about the only thing they could do was change spark plugs or engines. And the engines were very easy to change and replace. Uh, so about the only thing they really did was change spark plugs. But the airplanes didn't last very long any, either. Uh, Maybe you might fly an airplane you called your own with your own number and all on it, but then when you weren't flying, somebody else was flying it, and a lot of times it didn't get back. Uh, I was over Hainan Island just off of uh, Vietnam. There's an island there called Hainan Island. Uh, they had an airstrip on it. We were escorting B-25s out of the Philippines, all the way across is about, uh, that's about 800 miles of water between Hainan Island and the Philippines. And uh, we crossed over uh, there. I was uh, flying what they call purple flight, which is just an extra flight with uh, four P-38s tacked on to the squadron of 16. And... Uh, 
We were escorting the B-25s in there. The, uh, I had, uh, I went along because I had uh, three new wingmen that never had seen combat. I figured this was a good chance that they may see some Japanese and uh, have a chance. There's plenty of other fighters around. We'd be, should be pretty safe. So we went in there kind of behind the B-25s, so about four or five miles, and the rest of the squadron was right up with the 25s, and they were going in low to strafe and bomb. I saw some Japanese uh, call a flight, said drop tanks and punch my tanks off. They left. My wingman over here <clears throat> forgot to switch tanks from external tanks to the internal fuel, and he punched his tanks off and his engines quit. And so he fell way behind. I turned to see what, what, what his problem was, and he had a Jap shooting at him back there. So he had fallen back about three miles behind me, so I had to turn and go back. Um, and he, the Japanese saw me coming head on to him, and he pulled up to, to get some altitude, and I pulled up and shot him down. Uh, when I did, there was a whole flight of Japanese just above him, and I was maybe 140 miles an hour by then, hanging on the prop to shoot him down, and I kicked it off and took off out of there uh, to run down this wingman because I, I was tempted to shoot him down for causing all the problems. But uh, anyway, it turned out I didn't. <laughs> so anyway, I picked him up and started home. Uh, one of the Japs had shot up my uh, left engine, and I didn't know it, and it quit working just as we started home, leaving High Ann Island. And we were with all these 38s, so I sent everybody ahead, and I said, just send the PBY back down the track, and I'll pick him up, or they can pick me up if I'm in the water. So I started home alone, uh, flying uh, on, on one engine, and uh, had trouble with the cross feed of getting fuel to the right engine from other tanks that were on the left hand side, but I finally got them working. And anyway, finally got home and everybody had given up anyway. They'd all gone back to the barracks, uh, tents, uh, thinking I wasn't going to show up. But anyway, I finally came in alone about two and a half hours after they'd been there, and everybody went home. I was ready to come home. Uh, I wanted to, I knew we were getting prepared to invade uh, Japan. Uh, we were all being set up for that. Uh, there again, the pilots were not told when or where or anything, any of the details. But it was obvious that we were getting all prepared for this invasion of, of Japan. Uh, and I knew it was coming, and so I applied for leave back in the States. I wanted to come home for 30 day leave and get back in time enough to join the outfit and be part of the invasion. I wanted to be sure that I was there uh, because we had anticipated. Uh, uh, a real fracas, a real fight there over the homeland before we wiped them out and cleaned up all the air uh, to where there weren't any. Wouldn't be any air opposition, but for about a week or so, it was going to be hot and heavy. I had come home on this 38-day leave and was getting ready to go back uh, to combat, and uh, I was on my way to Luke Field and stopped off in El Paso and came down to the lobby uh, the next morning and the big headlines on the paper, we had dropped the atomic bomb. Of course, that was sort of like Pearl Harbor. I, we didn't know what the hell an atomic bomb was. Nobody ever told us anything about it. And, but, uh, and by the time I got to Luke Field uh, uh, in Phoenix, 
and getting ready to come overseas, they they were had dropped the second bomb and the war was over and that was it. Oh well, whoever thinks we shouldn't have dropped it is an idiot. I wish wish they'd had an opportunity to uh, be an invasion force. We anticipated about a million casualties. Uh, their philosophy was uh, uh, you die fighting. And uh, so we anticipated a real, real dogged fight. And uh, that's the reason I wanted to get back and get in at the end of it anyway. Uh, and that was, uh, was a known fact that uh, we probably saved a million I'm talking about our casualties. Can you imagine how many Japanese we would have killed? We probably would have killed millions, millions. And instead of people being thankful that we only killed maybe 80,000 in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, they're not, they, I don't know. I can't understand people that would think the way that way. I agree. But there are idiots, I guess, all over the world, in different shapes and forms. Uh, True. But they're usually through complete ignorance of the facts and no, and don't understand. It's like the people who are saying, "Withdraw out of uh, Iraq. Iraq." That is about as dumb as you could do it. I mean, if we withdrew out of Iraq, even I think even the Democrats now are beginning to see the light, and now they're talking about, well, we probably still would be there by uh, in uh, 13, uh, uh, 2013, which would be four years after they're in office. They could see you don't you don't pull out of a fight and leave all those people there because they're going to be taken over by Iran. Iran's going to terrify the whole Mideast, and I mean terrify them, because they'll be the only ones with the atomic bomb. And they're idiots enough to use it. And uh, why anybody would think that it would be better to pull out to save a few lives uh, and it would, at the cost of millions later, millions later. I just, beyond me, I mean, it's, that to me is confused thinking. You can't win a war without hurting people. You can't win a war without killing civilians. Not purposely, but accidentally. Because they the enemy embeds themselves into the uh, civilian population so that you can't separate them. And so you're going to hurt people. The price of liberty, I guess. Trying to be nice. You can't be nice and fight a war. Wars are not nice. The, uh, the Japanese weren't nice. And they turned us into being rather vicious ourselves because of them. Because you would get so infuriated and so mad at the things that they would do to our captives, to our, to our soldiers, that you had no pity on them whatsoever. But I never have understood and I will never be able to understand why the Japanese thought that they could take on the United States it's so ridiculous to even consider that they thought they could uh, uh, beat the United States at war. By 1944, we were turning out 50,000 airplanes a year. I mean, that's unbelievable. Uh, when you stop and think that uh, when the war started, we didn't have enough uh, rifles for the infantry to train and they were using broomsticks and whatever uh, in the place of rifles. I mean, they just, 
we, had, we were absolutely unprepared for war. But we went from being absolutely unprepared to, in a few months' time, just grinding out tremendous, tremendous amounts of equipment. I mean, you stop and think, the automobile business, they just completely shut it down and built nothing but military equipment. Uh, the River Rouge plant, the Ford plant, uh, was just being built. And instead of converting, uh, and they converted it to be 24s overnight. And it, it was just fantastic what they did. Could you imagine anybody, I can't imagine anybody doing World War II <clears throat> that would have been stupid enough to talk against the government, burn a flag. Uh, <laughs> That's so ridiculous. Uh, I mean, they left him hanging on a telephone pole somewhere if you'd burn a flag in World War II. The, uh, you just didn't do that. I mean, everybody was behind the war. I was going to get out of the service, but I had a, a clearance, a, a MOS number, an operations officer, fighter pilot, that uh, they wouldn't let you out though I had many points. And they held me in there until uh, uh, January of 1946. And then I got out, came back to Atlanta. Uh, they were just reforming the Air National Guard out at Dobbins, and I joined the Air National Guard and because they had P-47s. And they were the only fighters around, so Anyway, I joined them and flew with the Air National Guard. Uh, and then the uh, Korean War started. And uh, I went back on active duty. Had a, I had gone to electronic school and uh, knew something about radar. So they put me in charge of a radar squadron and we were to be shipped uh, to North Africa, where we were going to set up a radar net for the P40, uh, B-47 uh, that we were going to surround Russia with. Um, anyway, at, at the end of the Korean War, uh, I was back, uh, came back, took over the fighter squadron, became the group commander, squadron commander, group commander, uh, and then went back on active duty uh, as a, an advisor to the uh, Air Force on uh, fighter tactics uh, and of the reserve forces, Air National Guard. And so I was stationed at Warner Robins uh, for a couple of years and then went to Tactical Air Command, which is at Langley, and stayed there another eight or nine years and then moved to the Pentagon. Stayed there a couple of three years, came back, and retired out of the Air Force. I told them if they sent me to the Pentagon, I was going to retire, and I figured that'd scare them into not doing it, and it didn't work. They, <laughs> they sent me to the Pentagon, and I retired. Came, uh, came back to Georgia. Uh, Jimmy Carter had just been elected governor hadn't taken office yet, uh, and a friend of mine, uh, Ernie Vandiver, who is ex-governor, was going to be the adjutant general and asked me to be his uh, air adjutant general. And he and I were good friends, and so I said I'd do it if Carter wanted me, and I went down and talked to Carter and uh, had a 15-minute appointment ended up uh, almost two hours with him. And he impressed me uh, uh, in the conversation with him and all. And when I got ready to leave, uh, I said, I want to tell you, Governor, I, uh, I didn't vote for you, and I'm not a Democrat. And he laughed and said, that's all right. <laughs> uh, all of us have some kind of problems. <laughs> anyway. 
He and I got along fine. Uh, later on, our politics fell apart, uh, separated, but I became his adjutant general, stayed with him until he uh, uh, ended up being governor uh, or left. Uh, and so I left too. And went to work uh, in civilian life of, uh, spent my whole career trying to tear things down and uh, so I started seeing what I could build and got into the building business and built some houses and office parks and a few things like that. I developed this uh, subdivision we're sitting in now and sold it all out. And, Kept the five lots that are around me right here. Uh, but that was about it. Elected me to join it uh, or uh, be a member of it, uh, to be in the Aviation, Georgia Aviation Hall of Fame, and it's, it was quite an honor. There's a picture on the wall behind you there that uh, was when they presented me with it. And, uh, in turn, I gave them all of my, uh, quite a few of my mementos, uniforms, tapes, uh, combat films, uh, different things like that, uh, that they've got in the Hall of Fame down there. Aren't any messages they haven't heard. Or... The trouble is, <clears throat> they don't believe them, I guess. Uh, why do we have people in this country now that that we have a, a democratic party that looks like they had rather lose the war because they're so mad at, at the uh, Republican governor, uh, president. I mean, that's so ridiculous. I, I can't believe that we've got a Congress that had rather lose the war rather than let him win it. And he could. We could easily win it. All we got to do is get rid of the crybabies. They do great things and are capable of doing great things. But God, they, the brains are sometimes left behind somewhere. Uh, I don't know whether it's pickled in weeds, uh, smokes, alcohol, or whatever it is, drugs. But they're crazy, some of them. Just absolutely crazy. Young kids killing people. Uh, and I'm talking about young kids, 12, 13, 14 years old. Murdering people. I just, to me, that's so far, and I don't, you know, you can't visualize what must go through their mind. I hope we get over this sometime or another. Maybe if we get a war, we can bundle them all up and send them on it or something, if we get in a big enough war. <clears throat> but as I say, they're capable of doing great things. And they're capable of doing horrible things. And it's, I don't know how you separate them, how you divide them. All I know is you can't trust them now Someday, maybe we will be able to. What causes it? I don't know. Maybe over-communication or something. I don't really know. I don't have an answer for it. Mm -hmm.